And uh, today is a very special pleasure to have uh, Professor John Archibald from Dalhousie University here um, in Halifax, Canada. John is director of the Institute of Comparative Genomics. John is uh, among the founding fathers of uh, the field of endosymbiosis, uh, genome evolution, cellular evolution. How does uh, what does it mean to become a eukaryotic cell? Uh, wrote books. Was here the last time, as we figured out, June twenty first, two thousand sixteen. Did you come back to see your book later on? That must have been later. I know. Came the book out. Two thousand fourteen. Fourteen. That was before. He had a very nice book. One plus one is equals one. Very logic to you. After his talk, you will understand the title of the book. Um, this uh, many prizes of a highly recognized scholar in the field, and he just happened to drop by here. So uh, very excited to listen to what you have to say, and uh, it's an honor to have you here, John. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. It's, uh, it is a real pleasure to be back and to be reminded of the dates involved. Um, yes, yeah, so, y you know, you mentioned one plus one equals one. It, it is a recurring theme, I think, in, in my field. And um, as we were discussing earlier, I think the equation just keeps getting more and more complicated, but the answer is always still one, which is something to ponder. Uh, so, you know, it's been 25 years at least since I've been interested in this question of, of cells with multiple gene, genomes and genes in them. Uh, I do remember as an undergraduate in biology reading papers describing mitochondrial DNA and the <laughs> fact that, you know, cells like my own and, and yours um, have two very different um, genetic compartments with different evolutionary histories and somehow I was drawn to that question and more generally the question that uh, and the idea that molecules store vast amounts of information and th that there are interesting things we can learn about evolutionary history of life on earth by studying DNA so that's if there's kind of a route to all of my scientific interests that would be it of course what you're looking at here um, mitochondria on the left and uh, chloroplasts on the right. So we now know that these two organelles um, are derived from once free living uh, bacteria. So proteobacteria in the case of mitochondria and, and uh, cyanobacteria in the case of chloroplasts. Um, and it is because of the endosymbiotic origins of those organelles that the nuclear genome of, of modern-day eukaryotes is, is a mosaic. And so I just used this cartoon to show, you know, during the evolution of those organelles, genetic material moved from the, the predecessors of the, of the modern organelles into the nuclear genome. Protein products are synthesized on cytoplasmic ribosomes and then targeted back to those, those compartments. What we've come to realize more and more in the modern era of, of genomics is that uh, it's possible to recognize many of the genes that have come from mitochondria and, and chloroplasts by EGT, endosymbiotic gene transfer, but it can be difficult to uh, distinguish those types of gene transfers from other sorts of of uh, genetic flow, uh, lateral, lateral gene transfer or horizontal gene transfer. Um, viruses are, are clearly in the mix, as I'll talk about um, a little bit later in the talk. And this possibility um, that at least some foreign DNA in uh, the nuclei of eukaryotes can come from ingested food particles. This is a hypothesis, but not something that has been uh, tested experimentally with any level of detail. Now, one plus one equals one. This is uh, kind of a visual representation of that. I won't go through uh, too many of the details here, but as I mentioned, chloroplasts are derived from cyanobacteria, and that's what's depicted here in this, in this cartoon, CB. In the context of a, some sort of a eukaryotic host, during that integration, we have genetic material moving from endosymbiont to host nucleus. And the evolution of photosynthesis in eukaryotes is more complicated than that. We have what are called secondary and even tertiary 
symbiotic events where a primary plastid bearing alga becomes embedded within another eukaryotic, uh, in this case a secondary host. So there we have a, an additional wave of endosymbiotic gene transfer. And running through all of this, I would say, are uh, at least to a certain extent horizontal gene transfers. It can be into the progenitor of the, the chloroplast, but at various stages into the eukaryotic nuclear genome. And the end result really is a, a nuclear genome that is a mosaic of genes from uh, multiple uh, distinct sources, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, origin. And that makes it challenging to understand the evolutionary history of cells. And I want to also emphasize, too, that this phenomenon of secondary or eukaryote, eukaryote symbiosis is not sort of a, a, a curiosity, kind of an anomaly that, that, oh, that's interesting, but perhaps it's not very, very important. You know, some of the most abundant phototrophs uh, on the planet in the, in the world's oceans are, have acquired photosynthesis by this mechanism. So things like uh, dinoflagellate algae, so causing um, blooms of various kinds, uh, heteroconts or stromenopiles, things like single cell diatoms, massively abundant in the world's oceans. Uh, related to them are things like giant kelp, uh, haptophyte algae, you, you will have heard of them. This is a, a bloom off the coast of, of Newfoundland here that you can see from outer space. So it, it gives you some sense of the you know, biological significance of these nested symbiotic events uh, during evolutionary history. What I'm going to do today is uh, tell two stories. Um, the first one revolving around uh, a particular exploration of microbial algae and some comparative genomic work uh, on fine scale. Uh, on a fine scale stage, so strain specific variations in uh, genome size and gene content. And then I'm going to finish off with a discussion uh, of the role of viruses that we're um, learning about from our comparative genomic work. Now, as you can imagine, you know, with sequencing technology evolving the way it is, the, the landscape for study today is different than it was certainly in 2016, as we were discussing earlier. And, and when I started running a lab in 20, 2003, um, back then it was very much a case of if you were interested in eukaryotic microbial diversity, you uh, did your best to, to convince someone to fund the sequencing of a genome over here, uh, another genome over there, uh, maybe things like fungi or um, sort of a microbial pathogen of some kind would, would receive a disproportionate amount of attention for, for obvious reasons. But in general, you had just a single genome from uh, what could be a very, very large eukaryotic lineage. And, and as we can appreciate, you know, just having one genome from all of haptophytes or you know, cryptophytes um, really doesn't cut it. And it took us a while, or it took me a while at least, to, to come to that appreciation. And, and some lineages, of course, had no samples, uh, no genomes available whatsoever. So it's taken some time to get to the point where we can do comparative genomics in, I think, a, a somewhat more realistic manner. And with that comes more, I would hope, some, some more uh, sort of nuanced understanding of the comings and goings of genes in particular lineages. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today for the first part, is a comparative genomic invest investigation of what are called uh, pelagophyte uh, algae. Okay, so the plagophytes belong to the stromenopiles or heteroconts, if you're not familiar with these, with these terms. It's a very large chunk of eukaryotic biodiversity. Uh, many of them are phototrophs, uh, things like diatoms and, and kelp, as I mentioned earlier. Some of them are mixotrophic, so they're capable of, of both uh, phototrophy and, and sort of heterotrophic uh, forms of, of making a living. Others are exclusively heterotrophs, and there are parasitic lineages as well. So it's really a, a, a mashup of a variety of different um, 
modes of living, shall we say. And my students and I at the time were looking for particular parts of the eukaryotic tree where we could zoom in on a lineage and sample and, and sequence multiple genomes in a, a relatively inex, in a, uh, you know, a, an inexpensive fashion, but also in a, in a way that was realistic over the time scale, say, of a PhD project, as, as you'll see. And we chose the pelagophytes. Uh, at the time, there was one reference genome sequenced and I'll tell you about that one um, a little bit more as we go along, but it was from a, a brown tide causing organism, Oreococcus. And what was phylogenetically speaking important to us was the fact that the pelagophytes are nested within a, a, a broader uh, phylogenetic tree for which there was more dense genomic sampling. So you can see um, diatoms up here. This is outdated now, but 14 genomes at the time I made this figure. I can't remember when that was. Um, there's probably 114 at least diatom genomes now. But you can see some of these other numbers are quite large, including the oomycetes, which are um, plant uh, pathogens, and so very heavily sampled there. So again, pelagophytes nested within um, a genome sequence rich tree topology. As I mentioned, um, we wanted to be able to sequence the genomes in-house, so the genomes had to be reasonably small, and, uh, and they are, as we'll see. Uh, lots of strains available from public culture collections. Mixotrophic, so um, Oreococcus and friends are mixotrophic organisms, which is interesting. They have a, a virus associated with them, and I already told you about the nested phylogeny. And so the bulk of the work I'm going to tell you about today is uh, the work of a PhD student, Shannon Sibold, in my lab, um, an honor student, Maggie Lawton, who uh, was in the lab a couple of years ago now, and together these two students generated um, a total of seven genomes from this pelagophyte lineage for comparative genomic purposes. Now again, this is sort of the diagram that I showed you earlier, but, but the ability here again to dive into pelagophytes, and in particular multiple strains of the exact same species, uh, allows us to do this kind of telescoping in and out. Study strain-specific variation, and then contextualize that in the context of pelagophytes and their closest relatives, and then zoom out further still to some of these uh, broader broader lineages. And we want to, you know, ultimately some sort of synthetic picture of how genes have been coming and go going over time so we can better understand hopefully this process of lateral gene transfer uh, in the broader, against the broader background of endosymbiotic gene transfer. So at this stage I'll just introduce something that I think will be familiar to many of you, it's this concept of the pan-genome, and it's something that is, I think, pretty much taken as fact in the context of prokaryotic organisms. And really the idea here is that if you compare a set of genomes in this sort of generic diagram, five different strains, uh, and you ask the question, you, you sequence the genomes, you predict all the genes for all five genomes, and then you simply compare them in kind of a simple-minded presence-absence way. Um, how many genes are present in the core or found in all of them? And then there is a various levels of the accessory genome. And by this I mean simply genes that are either unique to one of the strains and not found in any of the others, uh, present in two or more strains, three or more, and so forth. So that's the distinction between, between core and accessory. Now, sort of the, the, just to illustrate this point briefly, the, the poster child, I would say, of, of pangenomics in bacteria is E. coli. As you can imagine, there are many, many thousands of genomes now, now sequenced. What I'm showing you here is a, a, a data from a paper a couple of years old now here, but what it effectively plots here as a function of the number of genomes along this axis here, 
on the bottom, and, and in essence, the, the number of genes, the, the pan genome is going up and up and up. So again, with 3,000 or so strain genomes sequenced, in this particular case, we're up to sort of 40,000 plus genes, which is, uh, is a lot of, ge a lot of genes in the pan genome. And, you know, the, the numbers say that with, with each and every new E. coli genome that is sequenced, sort of between 30, 40 something new genes are discovered that have never been found in E. coli before. So that's a, sort of the sense in which the E. coli pan genome is sort of growing continuously over, over time. And curiously, the, the core genome is shrinking uh, ever so slightly over time. So very occasionally you'll come upon a new E. coli that does not have a gene that was presumed to be uh, a member of the core prior to that, prior to that sequencing. Now I should say, this is E. coli. Uh, it's been studied, this pan genome concept's been studied in lots of other organisms too. And uh, depending on the, the mode of life um, and the, the biology of the prokaryotic lineage in question, some uh, organisms have larger or smaller pan genomes. So it's not uh, a given that they'll all look quite this dramatic, but it certainly is the case by and large that this is what, what bacterial and archaeal genomes tend to, tend to look like. Okay. Now, the question of pan genomes in eukaryotes is a little bit more uh, challenging and controversial, I would say. The, the term's been used for a good number of years now. Um, pan genomes have been studied in, in plants. You can see here Ariza, uh, glycine. In fungi, uh, you know, genomes that are very, very heavily sampled. Um, a very comprehensive study of over a thousand strains here in 2018. Um, Emiliania huxleyi, uh, a haptophyte alga, a very uh, influential paper published 10 years ago now by uh, uh, Reed et al. Uh, so you can see here the number of strains included uh, and so forth. So is it, are there pan genomes in eukaryotes? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, there are uh, differences, I would say, in how we define the pan genome and also the underlying biological mechanisms. Uh, my sense is that the, the people often speak of the human pan genome, so that term is used in, in the comparative uh, genomics field for humans. It doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, that lateral gene transfer is a process that is driving the pan genome. So, so just be aware of that. The term can mean different things to different communities of people. But, uh, you know, for people who study microbes like me, um, by and large, we're interested in the comings and goings of genes uh, by, the, by the process of lateral gene transfer. Now, you know, speaking of technological revolutions, we've been using Oxford Nanopore long read sequencing for uh, at least five years now, I think, um, pretty much as long as the instruments have been available. And uh, you, you will, I think, have come across these pocket sized instruments. The quality and quantity of data that is available from these, these machines is getting better and better. Um, in years past, we've always had to augment the, the sequencing projects with Illumina data, which is shorter reads, but much, much higher quality. But I think we're probably uh, at the point now where um, we'll soon no longer need to actually be generating uh, short read data to go along and error correct the long read data. The, the base calling accuracy is getting, getting that good. Um, and I don't think I need to, to tell everyone that the value of long reads in the context of genomics for, from a, a de novo sequencing and assembly perspective. And I'll just orient you to Oreococcus here and, and illustrate the, the potential of long read sequencing in a single table. So the original Oreococcus anaphagefrans genome was sequenced in 2011 by Chris Gobbler et al. Uh, a 53.5 million base pair genome, so a, quite a, a nice size for a, a nuclear genome to sequence reasonably. Um, but fairly fragmented, you can see sort of 5,700 or so distinct contigs. 
Now, Shannon Sibbald, my student, we purposely targeted this exact strain, 1984, because we would have a reference upon which to base our, our new sequences as a, as a test bed. And you can just see here um, the increase in contiguity of the genome. This is 142 contigs plus two organeller genomes. So the, the level of completeness, the, 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 the size of the contigs and scaffolds and the degree to which they represent complete chromosomes or, or near complete chromosomes is uh, quite dramatic. Um, and I think we could probably do even better than this now if we were to, to do this sequencing as opposed to even um, a couple of years ago. In addition to that, uh, my honor student at the time, Maggie Lawton, um, generated sequence data from two other uh, genera related to Oreococcus, something called Oreumbra and Pelagomonas. And these are the data here that you can see. I won't bore you with the details, but one particular um, assembly uh, stood out to us, the Plagomonas one, and this was, um, I think, pretty much the very first assembly that Maggie produced in the lab. Um, six plus two, so two organellar genomes and six, uh, six and only six contigs, which we were pleasantly surprised by. Uh, it turned out to be accurate. Um, this particular genome is eminently sequenceable. Uh, you know, the right amount or a, a low amount of repetitive sequence. And this was able, these six chromosomes were able to be sequenced telomere to telomere and assembled with no gaps. Uh, not bad for a fourth year honors project. Um, so kudos to Maggie for, for doing that. So, you know, this is the kind of data that we uh, start to collect. So we, again, we sequence all the genomes, we predict all the genes, we do, you know, functional uh, prediction pipelines, and then we just ask simple presence-absence plots, uh, uh, questions using these Venn diagrams, which you've uh, obviously seen before. What you see here are three Oreococcus genomes relative to diatoms here, so a, a unambiguous outgroup. And you can see there are, you know, core values here, but there are a lot of um, sequences at the periphery. So every time there is a number here at a sort of an outlier cell that's telling you that's about 9,500 genes found in Oreococcus that are not found in the other, uh, the other three genomes in the, in the analysis. This seems like a fairly large um, accessory gene number. Um, the question remains, you know, what is the sig biological significance of that uh, to the organism and from the quest question of genome biology and evolution? Now, before we dug into that question further, we collected data from four additional Oreococcus strains. So uh, all Oreococcus anaphagephrines, by name at least, and uh, these are from strains that were collected by Chris Gobbler and his uh, collaborators from uh, water samples on the eastern seaboard. And you can see this is a, a picture of a, a brown tide that Oreococcus forms. We also have information here on their susceptibility to lysis by a virus, which will become interesting uh, in a little bit. So Shannon um, basically hammered her way through all five genomes as part of her PhD project using the same analytical tools, Illumina, um, Oxford Nanopore, RNA-seq, uh, all the, as the assembly uh, gene predictions and uh, analyses um, downstream from that. So number of predicted genes, 25, thousand to 26,000 or so in the, in the predictions. So we were really interested to see, uh, to address at least to a first approximation, this question of the pan genome of this single species, anaphagephrines. And that's what's shown here. So again, the same Venn diagram, in this case, all members of the same species. So 16,300 or so genes in the middle and then uh, various uh, peripheral numbers along the outside. And 
if you sort of crunch the numbers on that, what you come up with is a core genome of about a little over 75% and an accessory genome of just under 25%. So that is unique to one strain or present in some combination of the strains. And if you ask the question, just the extremes, outer portions of this VEN, it's about 7% of the genes are strain specific. When you dive into the biology or the predicted functions of those proteins, many of them, um, as we'll see in a second, are enriched in things like cell signaling, transport, and metabolism. And through a, a phylogenomic pipeline that Shannon has run and analyzed by hand, um, a good number of these are um, predicted to be lateral gene transfers from bacteria. That's what's shown in this cartoon a, a slightly different way. This is showing you Oreococcus in the top right against these two other genera. And we can ask this question of what do we see when we look at the predicted lateral transfers in all three of these genera? It comes up to be a total of 1,207, presumed to be recent, uh, quote unquote, transfers into pelagophytes. And just over 400 of those are uh, unique to Oreococcus. And 82% of those are found in all five strains and 18% in only one of the five strains. So there's an interesting phylogenetic signal there uh, that's certainly worthy of investigation. And Shannon has been scouring the data to make sense and discern patterns of possible biological significance to these uh, uh, pangenomic data. What's shown here is just a, a simple visual representation of sort of sifting and sorting between the genes um, and their predicted functions. In the case of the Oreococcus lateral transfers, uh, we see up in the top left here uh, a cluster of LGTs related to um, low light and stress. Down here we've got membrane transport, this cluster right here. We've got two sort of spots where uh, metabolism of carbon and nitrogen, as well as lipid biochemistry are related, and a cluster here of ones in DNA protein modification and repair. So we can start to, you know, at a very coarse level, start to assign biological significance to the genes that we predict from the phylogenomic pipeline of, of lateral gene transfer. And what's interesting um, and, and gratifying, I should say, is that, that a lot of the data that I just described to you correlates with what uh, phycologists who've been studying the biology of these brown tides for um, Oreococcus are, are telling us. This is data um, from Chris Gobbler et al. again, and it's showing you data collected over a, a time series here. And what you can see here is uh, this brown spike here, labeled 2009. This is abundance of Oreococcus relative to diatoms, um, other small eukaryotes, and uh, Synecococcus, cyanobacterium, sort of as it, as it rose and then as it fell again, and related to these other sort of environmental parameters that they were collecting. Uh, uh, as they were studying the, the bloom. So light uh, intensity, um, dissolved inorganic uh, nitrogen, organic nitrogen, those kinds of things. And these are really the sorts of genes that, uh, that we found by lateral gene transfer uh, show some pretty striking parallels with those types of biological processes. And I should say too, more recently, um, the work of uh, Gann et al., Eric Gann in Steve Willem's lab um, in a Jay Fikal paper have done a, a deep dive into this question of uh, gene content in Oreococcus as it relates to nutrient acquisition as well. So um, we're quite, quite excited to see this. Now, one thing that often comes up at this uh, stage in a discussion of pangenomes and eukaryotes is how similar are the strains that I'm talking about here. 
Now, all five strains that we sequenced and that others have sequenced as well, they're, they're um, all given the name Oreococcus anifigefrens, but that is a, a label that's been given to them, uh, in some cases by convenience. They're all very small, um, brownish cells, uh, very difficult to distinguish from one another. And so it's conceivable that, in fact, we've been studying, you know, maybe different species of the same genus, and that could account for the differences in gene content. Uh, it appears that's not the case. Shannon has really dug into this, and what she has found is if you do a pairwise, you know, genome-wide comparison along the lines of what's shown in this, in this Mummer plot, there's a high degree of um, DNA, you know, similarity at the DNA level, more or less right across the, the genome. If you want to choose particular genes and ask the question, how similar are those genes, like a marker gene, for example, like 18S uh, ribosomal DNA, uh, all five strains have at minimum 99, uh, uh, up to 99.9% .9 identity in the 18S locus. And in fact, some of the organeller genomes that we sequenced, mitochondrial and plastid, are quite literally 100 percent identical from one end of the molecule to the other. So, you know, and again with a graph like this, if you do the DNA based alignment, um, there's, you know, a, a large fraction of the genome is alignable at about 99.9, .9, you know, 99 plus percent identity, which really speaks to their similarity. And yet they have, uh, you know, differences in gene content. So it, it's, it's an interesting conundrum, which, you know, does raise the question, for example, are they capable of sexual recombination, those kinds of things. There are questions that um, uh, my group at least don't have answers to. So I'm going to finish off with a, some uh, little mini stories about the role of viruses in genome biology and evolution for, for eukaryotes. And I should say that the segue here is some of the work that we've been doing on pelagophytes over the past few years. This is again work col collected by Maggie Lawton. And we sequenced the organeller genomes of these organisms, both mitochondria and plastids. And this was, was one particular uh, interesting observation whereby there was a, a little cluster of viral-derived genes present in the anaphagefferins uh, strains that was not present in the related uh, genera, Pelagomonas and Oreumbra. So if we zoom in on that region, there's a few genes here that are amenable to phylogenetic analysis, and this is one here, uh, DNA cytosine methyltransferase. And when we build a phylogeny of this protein, it's a protein-based tree. The oreococcus sequence is in red there, and its nearest neighbor in the tree is uh, the homolog present in the viral genome that infects the uh, oreococcus alga. So we would infer from that that this is a, uh, some kind of a, a gene transfer. It's in, into the organeller DNA. We do see these in some of our uh, comparative genomics investigations. So both mitochondria and plastids are capable of picking up foreign genes. And this is an example like that. Now I will say too that uh, Shannon, in analyzing the Oreococcus nuclear genomes that I, I told you about, very occasionally you will come across some real zingers, and this is one of them. Um, I should say, I didn't mention this, uh, before, but oreococcus is quite unusual. The, the GC content of the nuclear DNA is about 70%, so 68, almost 70%, which is uh, quite unusual uh, by and large. And GC anomalous regions in, against that kind of a background really stand out. Um, and this is an example of that, this highlighted region here. Um, I don't know how many, sort of like 15, KB or something like that stretch. And this is a stretch, again, of that vir virus uh, that has got integrated the DNA into the, um, 
into the Oreococcus nuclear genome. Uh, I don't think this stretch of sequence is functional in any way, but it is indicative of a very recent transfer of viral DNA into, into nuclear chromosomes. This is not something that's uh, new by any means. More and more people studying the genomes of eukaryotes of all kinds, phototrophs, heterotrophs, uh, microbes, uh, uh, you know, animals and plants and so forth, we're seeing this more and more. And it's, it's started to be something where actually um, you, you simply can't ignore the contribution of viral DNA if you're going to study genome evolution in eukaryotic nuclei. Now, another system that we've been working on in parallel is an amoeba called acanthamoeba. And that's an image uh, taken by my postdoc Dudley Chung in the in the top left there. Uh, Acanthamoeba is is a free living amoeba, um, and again we targeted this organism because of the sort of suite of properties that it had. Uh, this is not a phototroph; it's a it's a heterotrophic amoeba, but it can be grown um, both on on plates and in liquid culture in the lab azenically. It has a a small genome. Uh, relatively easy to sequence, I would say easy to sequence, in quotes. Uh, it is transformable, and it is also host to many of the giant viruses that were first discovered. So you might recall um, something called Mimi virus, which I think was discovered 20 years ago now, but uh, from Acanthamoeba, uh, Pandora virus more recently. So these are viruses, giant viruses with genomes that are in the range of uh, one to even two, two and a half million base pairs with thousands of, of genes. So very large, literally very large viral particles and large viral genomes. So for the, these reasons and, and more, we were focused on Acanthamoeba. Uh, we're interested really in using this as a uh, something of a model system to study how gene transfer happens mechanistically in the lab. Uh, and so this has involved over the, over the years um, two students of mine, Morgan Culp, a PhD student, and now Cedric Blay uh, as well. Uh, Morgan's been involved in um, studying uh, transformed cells and looking at the fate of uh, foreign DNA in the acanthamoeba genome. So we have some basic tools for isolating cl individual clones and resequencing their genomes. Uh, my postdoc, Dudley Chung, um, has, uh, after several years of hard work, succeeded in, in developing CRISPR-Cas9 editing as a tool for modifying the acanthamoeba nuclear genome. So we're pulling all of these tools together slowly but surely uh, to get where we want to go. Now, at the same time as this work was being done, we were uh, very quickly coming to the conclusion that the original uh, reference genome sequence for acanthamoeba castellanii, which is a, uh, a model a, a strain that is, is uh, worked on, it's called the NEF strain, it was published in 2013, so 10 years ago now. The genome was, was somewhat highly fragmented, and again, it was right around the time when we were using nanopore for the first um, time, and so we decided to invest in seeing if we could use that to improve the reference. And that's what we did. Uh, as it turns out, we teamed up with uh, colleagues at the Pasteur Institute, uh, Carmen Bookreiser and Roman Kozel, and also uh, Franz Lang in his lab at the Université de Montréal to put together telomere to telomere chromosomes for Acanthamoeba castellanii, uh, two strains, the NEF strain and uh, the C3 strain. And again, you'll see this Venn diagram. This is, uh, again, not surprising. Sequence assembly, annotation, and examine the uh, extent of overlap between the related strains. What I want to tell you about today is work being done by uh, Cedric Blay in the lab, and this is building on the fact that with these chromosome scale assemblies, we can start to look in fine detail at recent viral integrations into the nuclear chromosomes of NEF on the one hand and the C3 strain on the other. 
And this is the, the work of uh, probably a, a year or so by Cedric. Uh, we have several hundred predicted fragments or scraps in many cases of viral D DNAs being integrated. And what we wanted to do specifically was to ask the question, are there differences between the viral fo footprints, um, you know, viral DNAs of all kinds, giant viruses, uh, you name it, in the NEF strain compared to C3. And, and the diagram you can see here, every little uh, tick that you see is at least one snippet of viral DNA. Um, most of these analyses were done at the DNA <coughs> level, but also using um, protein blasts as needed. We see some evidence for clustering of these viral genes, um, and so they're highlighted in boxes. And this is perhaps not surprisingly sort of random pieces of DNA integrating into the, into the genome. Um, probably the most surprise to us, or to me at least, was the fact that there's um, very little overlap between the integration points in these two strains. So it seems like the viral footprints are quite distinct. We don't actually know the biological significance of that, whether it's kind of differential loss or whether uh, insertions are, have taken place uh, with different viral donors uh, in these two genomes. But nonetheless, there is a sort of a start point here for trying to put together a synthetic picture of just viral DNAs and the extent to which they're landing in the DNA and what their, what their fate is. And so Cedric has sort of, is heading along to carrying out a systematic investigation of this two-way study. You know, some of the, the things that we can potentially answer is are there non-random insertion sites of these viral bits of DNA? Uh, does this perhaps relate to chromatin structure? We have some data from our collaborative work on the genome paper where we can use high C data perhaps to to address this. We want to know whether there is a relationship between you know, the degree of chromatin condensation and the extent to which viral DNA can jump in. Uh, this issue of subtelomeric uh, um, insertions is a recurring theme. We see that in acanthamoeba and over and over again uh, in my conversations with people who are studying fine-scale genome evolution, oftentimes the, the telomeres, the, the regions of chromosomes right next to the telomeres are uh, places where foreign DNA accumulates. And the reasons behind that are, are far from clear, but uh, it's something that in principle we could, could answer. And also the directionality of the AG, LGTs, uh, it's, you, would, you would think if we're defining, in, in Cedric's data at least, these as being viral snippets of DNA, that they came from viruses. And they probably did, but the reality is the giant viral genomes that we're using in our comparisons are themselves often full of genes of eukaryotic ancestry. So the directionality of transfer is a non-trivial uh, matter. And so it's, I would say, early days for us to be able to look at any individual gene or fragment of DNA and say that it literally just came from a virus or perhaps it was a, a piece of eukaryotic DNA that went into a virus for some time and then landed back in the genome. I think all of those things are, are possible at this stage. Uh, and the final uh, virus story is something that was just published um, last week in Current Biology, and this is collaborative work done with Jackie Collier and Josh Rest at Stony Brook in the U.S. Now, we were helping um, Jackie and Josh with long read sequencing for uh, a heterotrophic protist called Arantiochytrium. Um, this was a genome that was sequenced by the Joint Genome Institute. And we used our um, nanopore technology in the lab to improve the, the assembly and combined with the JGI data, um, managed to put together, um, again, a fully resolved chromosome. Now, one of the things that Jackie and Josh noticed from the outset was a couple of anomalous sequences. 
One of them was a short circular element, which is just shown here in this, in this cir circle, about 300 kilobases or so. And there was also another region on one end of chromosome 15 that was flanked by repetitive regions. And all, all of this is supported by long read um, sequencing. These two uh, stretches of sequence are both about 300 kb in length, and they do show some sequence similarity. And this sequence similarity and the relationship between these viral sequences really became apparent when this paper here, Gaia et al., came out in Nature uh, earlier this year. And effectively what that paper did was to mine the Terra Oceans uh, data sets, these vast uh, data sets uh, from ocean samples around, around the globe, looking specifically for viral sequences. And they defined uh, effectively a new group of viruses called uh, Myris viruses or, or Myris viruses, if, if you like, as being some sort of a mosaic of a herpes type virus and um, another form of large DNA viruses. So the, effectively the Myris virus genomes that they sequenced from Terra Oceans contained genes that were um, somehow related to herpes viruses, but also ones to unrelated uh, large DNA viruses. And so my postdoc, Lucy uh, gallo Lavalle was able to connect the dots on this bioinformatically, and we were able to show unambiguously that these two sequences here, one of which is completely integrated into the nuclear chromosome, are uh, Myris virus in origin. Now Myris viruses are, are based on the Terra Oceans data, extremely abundant and common uh, in the world's oceans. And we have now um, the first known host, natural host of a Myris virus um, growing and being studied in the lab. Uh, we've been able to show that these genes are expressed and the next stage now, of course, is to verify that these uh, genomes are able to give rise to um, viral particles and so on. So that, that work is currently ongoing. So to bring it home to the title um, that I, uh, of this talk, Highways, Byways, and Bike Paths, um, mitochondria and chloroplasts are um, are, or at least were, the highways of gene transfer, I would say, for eukaryotic nuclei. They, the, you know, the bacterial progenitors of these two modern day organelles uh, contributed greatly to nuclear genome biology and also to the evolution of eukaryotic cells. You know, more uh, open is the, the contribution of these other potential donors to uh, nuclear genomes and to symbionts of all manner uh, are, are known across the eukaryotic tree, uh, the extent to which they're capable of providing genetic novelty to their hosts is by and large unclear. I've talked about viruses as potential donors. We've also got the possibility of interdomain conjugation. That sounds a bit strange, but it is actually uh, possible. Um, Diatoms, for example, have been shown to be able to conjugate with, with bacteria. And then um, one of the things in my introductory slide was this idea, you are what you eat. So the potential that food organisms can actually give rise to genes that make their way into eukaryotic nuclei. It's long been proposed, but is by no means uh, a sure thing. So, you know, I think highways can become byways. Uh, byways can become bike paths. Bike paths can be expanded, perhaps, over time to be, become highways. And so I, uh, at the risk of pushing this um, metaphor too far, I think I, I'm interested in, the, over long time scales, the sort of underlying biology, cell biology, biochemistry, molecular biology, that leads to these different paths of gene transfer becoming more or less prominent over evolutionary time. And with that, I will uh, thank uh, these people, the funders, uh, mainly for this work from NSERC and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, 
and the past and present members of my research team at Dalhousie. So thank you very much for your attention.